Imagine for a moment, instead of me walking out here and being announced just now, it was announced that I couldn't make it here tonight. And they're asking you to come up on stage and deliver a just under 18 minute talk on an idea of worth sharing. Anybody excited for that? No pressure, right? Who's up for it? Couple hands, okay, good. So some of you are some of you are some of you are really seasoned speakers, and so you get excited, you get energized, you're totally up for the challenge. I love it. But how many of you felt more like this? <laughs> right? Maybe not as excited, maybe a little terrified. Any hands on that one, maybe? Okay, more hands there, awesome. And so both responses, your physical, physiological, and psychological systems got activated. Um, but if you came up to actually perform, the way you would perform would probably be impacted by whether you felt really excited about it or not that excited. Some people report um, public speaking to be as fearful as dying. So you might have do a great job if you came up and felt like it was worse than dying. So um, I've been in the neuroscience field for over 15 years, and what we have learned so much about is how stress can either drive brain health or really drain brain health. And that's what we'll talk about tonight. Um, who would say you have zero stress, no stress in your life? Any hands? Yes. No hands. Who would say you have just the right amount of stress, the perfect amount, so it's kind of like it is? And who has too much stress, more than you need? Most hands go up there, right? So you are not alone, and you're in really good company. About three out of four Americans report having at least one stress symptom in the last month. And about one in five report that stress being severe. Um, about half of those people reported who were surveyed report having staying awake at night and not able to sleep. And then more than a third feel nervous, anxious, irritable, anger, and increased fatigue from having so much stress. So that's the bad news. On top of hindering our performance, and as a mental health professional, we know that these can also impact our mental health increased risk for depression, anxiety, and burnout. Here's a couple more stats for you. The World Health Organization recently classified stress as the health epidemic of the 21st century. They also updated their handbook of diseases to include burnout, which is defined as the syndrome as a response to chronic workplace stress that goes unmanaged. So, with that in mind, that end in mind, my intention for the talk tonight is to talk about what is stress, how do we define it, and then how does it affect the brain. But lastly, more importantly maybe, is what can we do to actually harness that stress to optimize our brain performance. Does that sound good? Learn about that tonight? Okay, great. So, when you, when you hear yourself saying to yourself, um, I'm so stressed, or he's so stressed, she's so stressed, we're all so stressed. What does that mean? Think it in your mind, how would you define stress in a few words or a sentence? If I were able to ask all of you to share, we'd probably get all different answers because everyone defines it a little bit differently. It might be an experience, it might be your feeling about an experience, and it might be the outcome of an experience. In, the, in 1951, in a British medical journal, a physician wrote there that stress, in addition to being itself, is also a cause of itself and a result of itself. So it's become a buzzword and it's related to a lot of different contexts. But let's go back to the origins. In 1936, Hans Selye, an Austrian endocrinologist, defined stress as the nonspecific response of the body to any demand made on it. How different is that from how you generally think about stress? Non-specific response of your body to any demand made on it. And actually, interesting point about this is Hans Selye, his work was done with animals. So animals are a little bit different than humans in our stress responses, right? Um, animals don't have the, the awareness and control in the moment to control their emotions, but they also don't perseverate and keep worrying about the stress like we might lose sleep over it or anticipate the worst in some situations. And so that's what we're going to um, have an updated version of, of what stress is. 
We adapted this with our collaborator, Dr. Ian Robertson, um, neuropsychologist and clinical psychologist. Here's our new definition of stress. The feeling that the demands made on you exceed your capacity to cope with them. And two key words jump out from this definition. Feeling, because that implies fundamentally that stress is an interpretation of your experience, and capacity, which implies it can be improved or changed. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight, those two things. How can we impact feeling and capacity? So I'm going to use a very um, sort of simple, practical terms to translate complex neuroscience just so there's a clear message as a takeaway. The blue area here on this brain highlights the frontal lobe, the part right behind the forehead, the prefrontal cortex, which is the, is the really reasoning part of your brain, responsible for things like making decisions, complex problem solving, regulating your emotions. And the little red area there is actually um, highlighting the amygdala, the limbic, sort of primitive part of the brain. And there's an either or phenomenon. Either your frontal lobe, your thinking, your reasoning brain is fully online and you're making good decisions and handling stress and all those things, or the amygdala gets fired up. Both can be fully firing at the same time. Either your frontal lobe, your reasoning part is online, or your emotional part is taking over. Think about a time when you've been really upset, maybe you got agitated, you may have said things you wish you hadn't said, or maybe later you thought to yourself, oh, I wish I had had this great comeback, but I couldn't even think clearly in the moment. So we have to calm down our emotional brain so that we have access to our better thinking. These are um, my two little dogs at home, Boomer and Bonnie, brother and sister, these are dog lovers. Um, so they don't have highly developed frontal lobes. Right? They aren't making a lot of great decisions, solving a lot of problems, definitely not regulating their emotions, which might be easy to test you for sure. Right? They're sort of living in the moment. They spend the most of their time laying around like this, not really solving a lot of big problems. And so what's important to know about this is they don't get stressed very often, but when they do, so for instance, this past weekend, as we were sitting in the back room and a raccoon bravely walked up to our glass doors and just kind of sat there looking at us for a little while as it was chewing on a nut that had fallen from the tree. Dogs went into full of amygdala response, total stress response. And I'll admit, I did a little bit too, especially when I saw two more huge raccoons up in the tree just watching the, this, this scenario play out. I think it was their entertainment for the night. Um, so in the moment, I was able to calm them all down by saying, it's okay, they're probably a very nice raccoon family, they're probably hungry, and they're here to do us no harm, right? And then the dogs pretty soon went back to doing this. So they had a quick emotional response, and they, though, didn't sleep, they didn't lose sleep over it, like I kind of did all night worrying about what these raccoons were doing in the backyard all night, but they're living there now, kind of totally freaking out. Um, and so, I want you to think about a time when you've been in a stressful situation, a stressful time that you have faced. What do you know that happens in your body? What do you experience? Probably things like your heart rate increases, right? And it feels like you're going really fast, maybe kind of shaky, kind of on overdrive. You might notice some uh, pressure and some tension that feels like um, some, some tenseness. Your breathing gets faster and more shallow. You might feel kind of panicky and nervous. This leads to decreased oxygen and blood flow to the brain because you can't think clearly. It feels like a brain fog. This is an example of Boomer um, during thunderstorms. He gets very, very scared. So he wears a thunder vest, which kind of helps him with calming down that, that physical energy that's very nervous. He's literally shaking like a little but now I want you to imagine a, an, an exciting situation that you've experienced or that you've faced in the past. What do you notice or what do you experience in your body during those exciting situations? A lot of the same things, right? This is back to Dr. Celia's definition of stress being a non-specific response to any demand made on it for change. So your heart rate may, might still increase, but you interpret it as maybe excitement and you kind of love that little extra adrenaline that, that you get from it. Uh, you might still feel some pressure, but it's really kind of more welcome as a challenge or some adversity to overcome. 
and your breathing might still be a little bit shallow and faster, but it feels more as um, anticipation or awe. And then lastly, you might still have some trouble organizing your thoughts, but it feels more expansive as opposed to, to, to so scattered. So this is Boomer and Lonnie getting picked up from the groomers, super excited with their boat, with their boat tied on, um, having all those physiological responses looking very different though than when I dropped them off at the groomers. So even psychologically, they know it's different because they're going home to treats and naps. This is all based on what's called the European Dodson Law. This is um, a, a law that we know that as stress or arousal increases, so does performance to a certain amount until it reaches that very top and then there's a very short time frame where you get your optimal performance until it starts this kind of gradual um, steady slope into more distress and anxiety. So the key is to stay in that sweet spot of stress and to get into that spot and stay there as efficiently and effectively as possible. So the two tools I'm going to share with you now are going to help you get in that state and stay there. When you see a photo like this, what's the first thing that comes to mind of what's happening in this picture? What's going on? When images like this are shown to large audiences, about half of the people will say, oh my God, she's about to fall. That looks really scary. And the other half will say, she's about to summit that rock. How cool, what a cool challenge. And you maybe saw both of those uh, scenarios and then maybe focused on one more than the other based on your own life experiences or your own interests. Maybe you don't like all that. But same scenario, just different interpretations of what's happening in that picture. And so think about your own life experiences when you've been in a situation where something happened and some people found it kind of cool and exciting and someone else in the exact same scenario, you know, found it really scary. Maybe like a roller coaster ride or having a baby, taking a test, <laughs> public speaking, right? Same scenario. Um, but how you interpret it changes your experience of it. And just like with the, with the talk opening, when I said you're going to come up and actually give the talk, depending on whether you saw it as exciting or close to dying, it would have impacted not only your short-term performance, but your long-term health. So this is all based on the term metacognition. This is defined as thinking about your thinking while you're thinking to improve your thinking. How great would it be if not only you, but everybody in your world every day was thinking about their thinking while they were thinking to have better thinking? And this leads us to our first strategy that I'm going to leave with you, reframing. This is all about refocusing your mindset and your emotion so that you can have optimal performance. Um, so in a big situation where you feel threatened, shifting very simply from that threat mindset to a challenge mindset. Bruce Springsteen has a really cool example of this. He was interviewed a few years back where they said, do you get nervous before you perform? And he said, I used to when I was younger. I would be sweating and shaking a little bit, forgetting words of songs. He said, but now, after a few years of being the boss, now I know that's my body's way of telling me it's time to rock. So he has reframed the same situation from a threat mindset to a challenge mindset. The next time you're faced with something that feels stressful, that simple shift changes your biochemistry. The second one is recharging. This is all about priming your brain to increase the capacity of your nervous system. And it's so simple, but as they often say, common sense is not a common practice. When you're stressed, but even more proactively as a practice, focusing on mindful breathing. When we're taking it in, in a more slow, deep breath, we activate the longest, biggest nerve in our body, the vagus nerve, which goes all the way from your brain to your heart to your lungs. Um, the, our breath is literally the bridge from our heart to our body. By simply slowing down your breathing and inhaling for about a count of four seconds and exhaling a little bit longer or even twice as long is the on switch for the vagus nerve. Let's do a quick practice. Slow down your breathing just a little bit, inhaling in your nose for about four seconds, and then exhaling out your mouth ideally so you relax your jaw, feel a lot of tension in your jaw, and exhale out your mouth as long or twice as long. 
you may notice an instantaneous calming of your nervous system in those 10 or 15 seconds. Imagine if you did that several times throughout your day, you would rewire your brain to be more resilient. So those, the, the two tools I will leave you with, reframing and recharging, truly builds resilience in your brain and your body. And why is this an idea worth sharing? Because with awareness, you have choice. Without awareness, there's simply habit. And our stress response is very habitual and it's automatic, it's unconscious. So by simply focusing on how you're looking at a situation and then recharging through mindful breathing, you literally rewire your brain, recalibrate your nervous system for resilience. I'm Gio Thank you so much.